Okay, so this second lecture video is going to introduce us to the main problem type, the main quantitative problem type out of chapter 9. We're going to um, go into an introduction of the tools that we'll be using, and then we'll see all of the different example setups that we will then have our own example videos for the way that we have in other chapters. So we're jumping around a little bit in chapter nine here to make sure that the lecture video for this one goes through the quantitative problem type. The pieces of the chapter that we have left are mostly more concept focused and uh, reiterating ideas that we have um, built on um, in the first two lecture videos. So for this um, chapter, for this particular video, we're going to be talking about the two conditions for equilibrium, and then we will see what problem solving um, strategies look like in this particular chapter. Okay, so the first condition for equilibrium is pretty straightforward. It's the same kind of thought that we've had in chapters four and five. When we first introduced static equilibrium in chapter four, the hanging rope kind of problems, the way that we solved those problems were by thinking about the net forces and how those net forces add up to zero. The total force adds up to zero because we have an object that is not moving. The velocity is zero and the acceleration is zero. So in practice, we'll see F net equals zero the same way that we did in chapter four in those kind of problems. And it's worth noting that the fact that the forces add up to zero just means that the acceleration is zero. It is a separate additional statement to say that the velocity itself is zero too. Because there is such a thing as dynam dynamic equilibrium. It's not something that we deal with in this particular chapter or um, in this semester as a concept, but it is something that we, um, that we can think about in physics. The second condition for equilibrium deals with this new quantity that we spent the first lecture video building up an understanding of that torque is the rotational ability of a force. We had the equation for what torque is. It's the force times the distance with this perpendicular idea built in. And so another condition for equilibrium is that we don't have rotation. That means that all of the torques added together have to add up to zero. The way that we're going to see that play out in this chapter is that all of the clockwise torques equal and balance all of the counterclockwise torques that get added together. One of the last things we talked about in the first lecture video is that the way that we are going to, in Physics 125, the way that we are going to describe the direction for torque is clockwise versus counterclockwise. Which way is it trying to rotate? So we'll see that happen in all of these different example videos. We'll see how that actually gets used in problem solving. So when objects are not rotating, the torque adds up to zero, and when objects are also not moving, then the forces add up to zero. It's these two equations together that allow us to solve what we call statics problems, where we have a situation given to us, and there's more than one unknown in a lot of cases that we can then use two different equations to solve for those multiple unknowns. Now the first example that we're going to see, it will have its own full video, is a fairly straightforward seesaw. We have two blocks that are um, placed at different distances. And one thing that I want us to think about as we do these kinds of problems is to try to have at the start of the problem an understanding of what this generally looks like. The fact that if we have a heavier object and a lighter object, that heavier object has to sit towards the center of the seesaw, and the lighter one is going to be further away. So when we do this example as its own video, we're going to find that that distance that is unknown here is larger than 0.3 meters. It's always something that's useful to keep in mind. We'll also see this example where we have two different supports and one thing um, standing on that and how the process is very similar. We just have to choose one of those two supports to be our axis of rotation. We'll see that in its own fully worked video. But those first two examples, if you go back and read the slides, um, in both of those examples, we are pretending that that object that is doing the rotating, the bar or the stick, has no mass. 
But in real world circumstances, whatever we're using as that balance beam, it has its own mass. And so gravity of the, ma uh, of the block itself, the bar or the beam or the stick, gravity acts on that thing as well. It is really important for us to understand that when we have this kind of situation, gravity acts at a single point. We can absolutely correctly build a um, correctly build a problem where we treat all of the mass as being concentrated at that central point. That point is called the center of gravity or the center of mass. Um, and it's not necessarily the um, like physical center, but it's where there's equal amounts of mass on all sides. So for symmetric objects um, like this can of tomatoes, um, the center of mass would be up and down in the center and side to side in the center. And so it would be fairly straightforward to kind of build that, um, build that picture. For something where there's heavier stuff on one side than the other, we might have to balance it a little bit differently. And that's what you can kind of think of with some of the, um, some of the writing utensils you might have around. This cap um, end is a little bit heavier. And so when I try to balance this, um, it actually isn't quite in the middle of the marker, uh, but it's, it's close. So not quite in the middle, but, but pretty close. So when we have that in a problem, it means that we have a force from the bar itself here drawn with a really big arrow that we have to account for, even if there aren't blocks on top of that beam. So um, with the problems that are lettered like this, 9A, 9B, as a reminder, these all have their own video that you really should be watching start to finish, trying on your own during the video or before the video or trying it again afterwards to get the practice where you're seeing the problem worked out the same way that we would do in an on-campus format. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is these first four examples that we kind of flash through in the slides, you can always open up the slides themselves to, to review them. All of those first four examples had a flat bar and all of the forces were up and down. It meant that we didn't actually have to worry that much about the idea of perpendicular. But it is worth making sure we keep that in mind because as we get into the what I would call tougher problems in the chapter, we need to be able to handle when we have um, more to think about Either we have side-to-side -side forces and up-and-down forces, or we have forces at angles. And we'll see all of these different examples show up in the, um, in the example videos and in the upcoming slides. Now, um, I'm not going to try to rearrange the, the computer to be able to, to do this, but what I want you to try to do at home is lean up against the wall. Maybe have one foot on the ground um, and one foot just kind of like tucked behind you and have one hand on the wall itself to lean up against, kind of at an angle, almost the way that a ladder does. Now, it's worth, if you, if you have the ability to, pause the video and try that, and think about what forces have to be acting on you to allow you to be stationary and not rotating, right? Not falling into the wall and falling over, or falling away from the wall and falling over. So I'm gonna draw this on the whiteboard so if we think about what's going on, we have my very exciting stick figure person. <laughs> my, my very exciting stick figure person who's got one foot on the ground and one hand on the wall. Okay, so let's think about what forces are actually acting here. We have four the wall, the wall is pushing back on the person. We could think of that like a normal force, but there is definitely a force here pushing away from the wall because while we push on the wall, that means that the wall is pushing back on us. That's an um, aspect of Newton's third law, the equal and opposite forces idea that um, we think of as normal force, but it's worth recognizing that if we can feel ourselves pushing on the wall, it's because the wall is pushing back on us. An easy way to imagine this is if somebody were able to snap their fingers and immediately remove that wall, you'd fall, 
um, through the place that once was the wall, and you'd rotate um, back that direction. So the wall's preventing you from falling like that. The other thing that we can um, comfortably think about is the fact that the floor is also pushing up on your foot. The same way that you are pushing down on the floor, the floor is pushing back up on you. That is also a normal force in a sense. We have that um, wherever your core is, gravity is pulling downwards on you. So this is gravity. This is the normal force from the floor. So let's go back and label this one. It's the normal force from the wall. And if we draw this in a free body diagram, in a force diagram, give me a second here. So a force diagram or free body diagram. Then we have gravity down and we have the normal force from the floor up and we have the normal force from the wall pointing to the right the way that I've drawn this person and if we think that those are the only forces acting on this person we have a problem here right if there's only force pointing to the right then we would move to the right that isn't happening because there is a force pointing to the left imagine instead that instead of the floor that you currently have, whether it's wood or carpet or linoleum, whatever, if it were suddenly extremely slippery, like icy almost, then your floor would, your foot would slip out from under you. The fact that you're able to stay there stationary is because there is a force keeping your foot in place. And if you are thinking in your head what we would call that force, it is in fact friction. and it's preventing your foot from sliding. So friction is preventing your foot from sliding. And so if we look at these forces, we could think about all of these forces as if it's a chapter four or five problem, but even if we knew what our mass was, and we would know what gravity is, we would know what the force from the floor back up is, because there's no other up and down forces, but that wouldn't necessarily be enough for us to know how we are preventing ourselves from rotating. If we didn't know, for example, if we did not know the coefficient of friction for the floor, there wouldn't be a way for us to calculate friction or the force that the wall is applying. And so what we have to do instead, I don't know why I took it away, what we have to do instead is think about this as if we are a um, torque situation where when we are looking at the torque itself, we are rotating around our foot. If the wall suddenly pushed back on us a whole bunch more, so let's say somebody just shoved on our hand, we might fall over this way. If somebody were to erase the wall, we would fall over that way. And so what we have is a situation where there is a force from gravity trying to cause us to rotate one direction. In this case, it would be counterclockwise. And there is a force from the wall trying to get us, so I'm going to call it F wall, trying to get us to rotate the other direction or clockwise here. And it's because those torques balance that we are actually able, able to stay stationary. Now, if you haven't watched any of the um, example videos yet, and you probably wouldn't have if you're watching them in the order that we put them um, in the um, playlist, then that might not make full sense to you yet, but it's worth drawing that, and you can always rewind the video um, to have it on the screen. It's worth drawing that out because what we can do is do a whole bunch of similar problems where those are the kinds of forces that are acting on an object that is trying to prevent itself from rotating. Now, it would actually be kind of easy to um, make me fall over if I were the one leaning up against the wall. But chickens, for example, they are actually much more stable compared to humans because their center of mass is so low. Okay, for those of you who have seen me in class, I'm six feet tall. I am pretty tall and I was um, from like middle school onwards. I fell over a lot, 
tall people are much less stable simply because their center of mass is so high. The further um, down your center of mass is, especially compared to um, rotation uh, points like hip joints, things like that, the more stable um, you really are. Now, with this poor chicken, our textbook has put into a windstorm, and that's going to be an example that we have a full video for as well. Who knows why that chicken um, got caught in the windstorm, but we have a full worked example to show how we can use the idea of net forces adding up to zero and the torques adding up to zero to figure out how strong that wind would have to be. Whenever we have forces in two directions like this, in the side to side direction and the up and down direction, we have to be really careful to make sure we understand this perpendicular idea. This side to side force from the wall needs the up and down distance to the axis. And this up and down force of gravity needs the side to side distance to the axis. When you watch that chicken video, um, <laughs> you'll be able to see that in action, as well as the upcoming um, several examples as well. The three upcoming examples that we have are now more complex examples where we don't just have super simple sideways distances and up and down forces like the first four examples did. If we are a certain distance horizontally from the axis, we need the y component of the force. And if we are a certain vertical distance away from the axis, then we need an x component of the force. You can kind of make yourself a little chart that is um, thinking about these kind of if-then statements. If the horizontal thing we have already is force, we need the vertical distance. If the horizontal thing we have is distance, we need the vertical force. If the vertical thing we have is force, we need the horizontal distance. And if the vertical thing we have is distance, we need the horizontal force. Kind of what we have on the slide, but with a couple of extra cases as well. You can always rewatch that video to make sure you understood it, but the key thing is that one X thing and one Y thing are what we need. But, and this is extremely important, if we think back to that first lecture video and some of the discussion that we had, we cannot take two separate components. We can't have a sine and another sine or a sine and a cosine piece. We're looking for what we already have fully in a particular direction. So for example, in this um, example 9F, our bar is perfectly horizontal, which means that all of the distances are going to be horizontal distances, and we need the up and down forces. That's straightforward for the force of gravity, but this rope that is angled means we only want the up and down, the vertical component of the tension, and we'll see that in the example video for it. In this other example with a ladder and a person standing on that ladder, it is extremely similar to the picture that we drew on our um, whiteboard, where in the previous example, we were leaning up against the wall. And so we had up and down forces and we need vertical distances. We had horizontal forces and we need vertical distances. That same thing is gonna play out here in this example video that you can watch separately. And then the last fully worked example um, from this chapter, from this section, um, is example 9H, where the bar itself is angled, and so all of the forces are going to cause us to look for components of that distance along the bar, using that 10 degrees to help us get those horizontal or vertical distances, depending. This example is the last one out of our set of um, eight examples, it is also one of the toughest. But it leads eventually into our discussion that we will have in our final lecture video, the fact that the numbers and um, distances for um, the previous problem, forces and distances, they are really consistent with somebody who is trying to lift something by just bending at the waist instead of lifting with your legs. When we talk about, if you've ever heard somebody say you have to lift with your legs, what we mean is that we're trying not to bend so much at the waist that you have these huge, huge tens tensions in your back muscles. That's how people get hurt. And so later in the slides, in the last um, 
video that we're going to see in chapter 9. We'll have a whole bunch of examples of um, muscles and joints and how that's using the same principles that we have um, with these kind of simple bar and block problems. So the last thing I want to leave us with for this particular lecture video is that sometimes students feel like they just haven't seen enough different statics problems or especially if we don't really watch all those videos through, which we should be, right? They're here um, for us the same way that if we were sitting through lecture. But we do have a much longer set than usual in our extra practice set for this chapter, extra practice nine. You can do whatever you want with those examples. That's true of all of the chapters that we do. But we want to make it clear that we have all of these resources to practice this problem type. We haven't seen fully worked examples in the lecture video that you're currently watching because they all have their own separate video. But it is really important that we recognize that we have videos to watch that are fully worked examples and we have um, written out examples in that extra practice set, both the questions and then one page each all the way through um, going through these examples for us. So in some cases, on homeworks, you will only try a particular setup once, but in order to prepare ourselves for quizzes and tests and final exams, whatever we have, make sure that we recognize that that's a place for us to practice a whole lot more than what we might have had otherwise. So the last video that we watch will cover the last sections of the chapter that weren't in this one in the previous example, uh, the previous lecture video. And so I will see you in that final chapter nine video.